Father, we're so grateful for this day and for the coolness of this location in which we're worshiping presently. We're grateful for the summertime, but it brings with us heat. And so, God, thank you for allowing us to be able to worship you comfortably here. But thank you more importantly for the ability to just to be able to assemble, to not fear our assembly, to not fear the songs that we're singing, to not fear praying to you and preaching your word. Continue, Father, to bless this country and allow us to be able to keep that priority. It is something that is so elemental and so biblically sound and important. We pray, Father, that you would continue to watch over this country as we celebrate its birth coming up this week. Continue, Father, to bless it as you would. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. So, depending upon my own personal schedule, sometimes I prepare messages that I present to you weeks in advance, sometimes even months in advance if it's a series, and sometimes days in advance. I just want to give you the caveat that I did not prepare this after the debate on Thursday. <laughs> Steve mentioned to me that because of the results of the debate, there may be some who are looking for an exit strategy, but that's not what this lesson was intended to be about. So just a disclaimer. It's taken from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. Those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right. For there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. Indeed, how can people avoid what they don't know is going to happen? None of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. There's no escaping that obligation. So this next photograph is a picture of a man whose name is Carl McCune. Carl McCune. Very affable man, as you can tell, very friendly. Had a love of the outdoors. He moved to Alaska in the late 1970s. He took up a trucking job at the Trans-Alaska Pipeline where he made very good money and concocted this adventure that still bewilders the 49th state. At the age of 35, he embarked on a five-month photographic expedition in the wilds of Alaska. Friends described how seriously he had prepared for this adventure. He had devoted a year to making plans and checking details. He solicited advice from anyone who he thought could provide him with good counsel, and he purchased all of his supplies. And then, in March of 1981, he hired a bush pilot to drop him into a very remote section of Alaska in a lake near the Colleen River, some 70 miles northeast of Fort Yukon. This is in the very far north reaches of Alaska. He took two rifles, a shotgun, 1,400 pounds of provisions, and 500 rolls of film because he wanted to photograph his adventure. He set up his tent and set about his season of isolation blissfully, completely unaware that he had overlooked a detail that ultimately would cost him his life. You see, Mr. McCune had made no arrangements to be picked up. And overlooking that particular detail would ultimately cost him his life. His unbelievable blunder did not dawn on him until August. Now, he had started his adventure in March. And we know that information because of a hundred-page loose-leaf diary that the Alaska State Troopers found near Carl's body the following February. In an understatement the size of Mount Denali, McCune wrote, quote, 
I think I should have used more foresight about arranging for my departure. And as the days shortened and the air chilled, he began searching the ground for food and the skies for rescue. He was running low on ammunition. Hiking out was now impossible. He had no solution but to hope that someone in the city would notice his absence. By the end of September, the snow was piling up, the lake was frozen, and his supplies were now nearly gone. His body fat began to metabolize, which would make it more difficult to stay warm. Temperatures are now hovering around zero, and frostbite began to attack his fingers and toes. And by late November, McCune was out of food, he was out of strength, and now he was out of optimism. One of his final diary entries read, This is sure a slow and agonizing way to die. Isolated with no rescue, trapped with no exit, nothing to do but wait for the end. I mean, it's chilling, literally. And puzzling. I mean, why, of all the time that he spent planning, why did he not have an exit strategy? Didn't he know that every trip comes to an end? It's not like his excursion was going to last forever. And it's not like our excursion is going to last forever either. Hearts will feel a final pulse. Lungs will empty a final breath. Unless Christ returns before our appointed time, we are all going to pass away. Fred Kuhn said in his book, Fundamentals of Faith, Death is the most democratic institution on the planet. It allows for no discrimination, tolerates no exceptions. The mortality rate of mankind is the same the world over. One death per person. Or as the psalmist frankly observed, no one can live forever. All are going to die. No one can escape the power of the grave. That's Psalm 89, verse 48. Young and old, good and bad, rich and poor, neither gender is spared, no class is exempt. Ecclesiastes 8.8 again says, None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. None of us. The geniuses, the rich, the poor, no one's going to outrun it, and no one can outsmart it. Julius Caesar died. Elvis Presley died. Oh, well, we think he did. Right? John Kennedy died. Princess Diana died. We all die. Nearly two people a second, which would mean more than 6,000 an hour, more than 155,000 every day, or about 57 million people a year pass away. None of us are going to escape it. The finest surgeon might enhance your life, but can't eliminate your death. The Hebrew writer was particularly blunt in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. People are destined to die once. So you can exercise all you want. You can eat nothing but health food. You can pop fistfuls of vitamins. You can stay out of the sun. You can stay away from alcohol. You can stay off of drugs. You can run a marathon. You can train with a triathlete. You can do your best to stay alive and still you will die. Death seems like such a dead end. <laughs> no pun intended. That's until we read Jesus' resurrection story. In Matthew 28, verse 6, it says, He is not here. He has risen from the dead as He said He would. So, go back with me if you would. It's now Sunday morning after the Friday execution. Jesus' final breath had sucked the air out of the entire universe. 
as his body seemed to be moldering in the grave, no one, no one was placing bets on his resurrection. His enemies were quite satisfied with the job that they'd done. I mean, the spear in the side basically guaranteed Jesus' demise. His tongue had been silenced forever. His last deed was now done. They raised a toast to a dead Jesus Christ. Their only concern were these kind of annoying disciples. So the religious leaders made a request of Pilate. And they said in Matthew chapter 27, verse 64, Give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. But their concern really wasn't that necessary. Because the disciples, as we know, were in full meltdown. When Jesus was arrested, it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 56, all the disciples forsook him and fled. Peter followed him from a distance, but soon caved in and cursed Christ. John watched Jesus die, but we have no record that he ever gave any thought to seeing Jesus ever again. The other followers didn't even linger around. They cowered kind of in the Jerusalem cupboards and corners for fear of a cross that bore their name just like their teacher. No one dreamed of a Sunday morning miracle. Peter didn't ask John, for instance, well, what will you say when you see Jesus? Didn't happen. Mary didn't ponder, gee, I wonder what Jesus will look like when he's raised from the dead. That's not there. They didn't encourage each other with quotes of his promised return, but they could have. There are at least four times in God's word where Jesus said something like this. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. The Son of Man, referring to himself, is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. That's not just one time in the Bible, that's no less than four. You'd think someone would have maybe mentioned that prophecy and done the math. Like, hmm, he died yesterday, today is the second day, he promised to rise on the third day. Friends, I think we'd better wake up early tomorrow. They did not have that conversation. But Saturday didn't see those plans. On Saturday, the enemy, for all they knew, had won. And their courage was now gone, and hope had caught the last train to the coast. That's from American Pie by Don McLean. They planned to embalm Jesus. They never had any plans to talk with him ever again. When the Sabbath was over, it says in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now honestly, do you see some sort of fancy celebratory Easter parade here? <laughs> no, you don't. Is this like a victory march? Hardly. More like a funeral procession, right? To anoint the body of Jesus. It may have been Sunday morning, but their world was stuck on Saturday. So it was left to the angel to lead them into Sunday morning. And it says... In Matthew chapter 28, verses 2 through 6, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. 
the angel said to the women, don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where they laid him. See, God shook the cemetery. Trees swayed and the ground rumbled. Boulders bounced and the women struggled to maintain their balance. They looked in the direction of the tomb only to see the guards scared stiff paralyzed, sprawled on the ground. And it's kind of hard to miss the irony here. I mean, the guards of the dead appear to be dead, while the dead one appears to be living. And the angel sat on the dislodged stone. He didn't stand in defiance or crouch in alertness. He sat. And again, there's some irony here. The very rock intended to mark the resting place of a dead Christ became the resting place of his living angel. And then the announcement. He has risen. Now, it's three words in English, but just one word in the Greek, agarthe. So much Church rests on the validity of that three-word phrase or that one Greek word. So much rests on it. If it's false, then the whole of Christianity just folds like a cheap suit. But if it's true, then God's story has turned your final story into an exit strategy. If the angel was correct, then you can believe this, that Jesus descended into the coldest cell of death's prison. And just when the demons began to dance, Jesus pressed his pierced hands against the inner walls of the cavern and shook the cemetery. The ground rumbled, the tombstones tumbled, and out he marched. The cadaver turned king. The mask of death in one hand and the keys of heaven in the other. Agerthe, the Greek word. He is risen. Not risen from sleep. Not risen from confusion. Not risen from a stupor or a nap. Not spiritually raised from the dead. Physically raised from the once dead. The women and the disciples did not see a phantom or experience some gushy sentiment when they saw him. They saw Jesus in the flesh. It is myself, Jesus said, as Luke writes in Luke chapter 24, verse 39. The Emmaus-bound disciples, remember, they thought Jesus was just a fellow pilgrim. His feet touched the ground, his hands touched the bread. Mary mistook him for a gardener. Thomas studied his wounds. The disciples ate fish that he cooked and bread that he had baked. We just talked about that last Sunday. The resurrected Christ did physical deeds in a physical body. In Luke chapter 24, verse 39, I am not a ghost, he explained. Handle me, see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as I have. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ means everything. If Jesus lives on only in spirit and deed, then he's but one of a thousand or more dead heroes. But if he lives in flesh and bone, he is the king who pressed his heels against death's head. And what he did with his own grave, he promises to do with yours. Empty it. Death is not the final chapter in your story. In death, you'll step into the arms of the one who declared in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, 
I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Winston Churchill was a believer. In fact, according to Churchill's instructions, there were two buglers that were positioned high in the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. And at the conclusion of the service, the first one played taps. You know that song. The signal of a day completed. Immediately thereafter, and with the sounds of the first song still kind of ringing in the air, the second bugler played Reveille. That one, remember? Which is the song for a day beginning. Which for Winston Churchill, in his mind's eye and for us, was entirely appropriate. The song of a day begun. A day ending and a day beginning. Death is not a pit. It's a passageway. It's not a crisis, but it's a corner that's turned. Dominion of the Grim Reaper? No, it's not. It's the territory of the soul keeper who will suddenly and someday announce Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Your dead will live. Your corpses will get to their feet. All you dead and buried, wake up. Sing. Your dew is morning dew, catching the first rays of the sun. The earth bursting with life, giving birth to the dead. Now that church is an exit strategy. And I want you to have one. Because too much of this world thinks that, like Rover, when you're dead, you're just dead all over. And it's not true. For each of us, we do not like dealing with sadness and the deaths of loved ones. All of us have. And someday, your loved ones are going to be mourning your passing too. I mean, unless Jesus comes before that. But I don't want you to mourn that thought because it's a passageway. It's just the beginning of an eternal life with God. And most of you here are Christians and believers. And so your hope is that this isn't your final destination, but living with God is forever. And so this is just a transition period from birth to death. Our life is just but a vapor, right? A, a wisp of smoke. It's here like grass one day and it's burned up from the heat the next. We're here just for a moment. But we live with God forever. So it's not probably the cheeriest, happiest sermon you can hear and you can leave the church building floating like, oh, wow, Randy gave a great sermon on death today. I mean, that's probably not going to be your reaction. But it is a reality. And so for all of us who have dealt with the death of loved ones, and for those who will be dealing with ours at some point, you have a promise. You have a hope. You have a home with God forever. So live now like you do. That's your challenge this week. So Steve is going to lead us in softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. He's calling all the sinners to come home. He wants you to be home with him. That's where he's at. He's at the right hand of God. He's interceding for us. He talks to the Father on our behalf. There are times where we just even don't even know what to say. And the Spirit intercedes, and Jesus understands, and He talks to the Father when we don't have words to form to express how we're feeling. We have an advocate, and He's calling you to come home. 
And so as we sing this song, if you have any prayer requests, you can send them up. We'll, we'll talk about those. We'll pray about those. And then we'll be dismissed. So if you would, let's stand and let's sing, please.